Chapter Two, Adam, Part Five of the Legends of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Brian Ness. The Legends of the Jews, Volume One by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg. Sabbath in Heaven. Before the world was created, there was none to praise God and know Him. Therefore He created the angels and the holy Hayot, the heavens and their host, and Adam as well. They all were to praise and glorify their Creator. During the week of creation, however, there was no suitable time to proclaim the splendor and praise of the Lord. Only on the Sabbath, when all creation rested, the beings on earth and in heaven all together broke into song and adoration, when God ascended his throne and sate upon it. It was the throne of joy upon which he sate, and he had all the angels pass before him, the angel of the water, the angel of the rivers, the angel of the mountains, the angel of the hills, the angel of the abysses, the angel of the deserts, the angel of the sun, the angel of the moon, the angel of the Pleiades, the angel of Orion, the angel of the herbs, the angel of paradise, the angel of Gehenna, the angel of the trees, the angel of the reptiles, the angel of the wild beasts, the angel of the domestic animals, the angel of the fishes, the angel of the locusts, the angel of the birds, the chief angel of the angels, the angel of each heaven, the chief angel of each division of the heavenly hosts, the chief angel of the holy Hayat, the chief angel of the cherubim, the chief angel of the Ophanim, and all the other splendid, terrible, and mighty angel chiefs. They all appeared before God with great joy, laved in a stream of joy, and they rejoiced and danced and sang, and extolled the Lord with many praises and many instruments. The ministering angels began, Let the glory of the Lord endure forever. And the rest of the angels took up the song with the words, Let the Lord rejoice in his works. Arabat, the seventh heaven, was filled with joy and glory, splendor and strength, power and might and pride and magnificence and grandeur, praise and jubilation, song and gladness, steadfastness and righteousness, honor and adoration. Then God bade the angel of the Sabbath seat himself upon a throne of glory, and he brought before him the chiefs of the angels of all the heavens and all the abysses, and bade them dance and rejoice, saying, Sabbath it is unto the Lord. And the exalted princes of the heavens responded, Unto the Lord it is Sabbath. Even Adam was permitted to ascend to the highest heaven, to take part in the rejoicing over the Sabbath. By bestowing Sabbath joy upon all beings, not excepting Adam, thus did the Lord dedicate his creation. Seeing the majesty of the Sabbath, its honor and greatness, and the joy it conferred upon all, being the fount of all joy, Adam intoned a song of praise for the Sabbath day. Then God said to him, Thou singest a song of praise to the Sabbath day, and singest none to me, the God of the Sabbath? Whereupon the Sabbath rose from his seat, and prostrated himself before God, saying, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. And the whole of creation added, And to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. This was the first Sabbath, and this its celebration in heaven by God and the angels. The angels were informed at the same time that in days to come Israel would hallow the day in similar manner. God told them, I will set aside for myself a people from among all the peoples. This people will observe the Sabbath, and I will sanctify it to be my people, and I will be God unto it. From all that I have seen, I have chosen the seed of Israel holy, and I have inscribed him as my firstborn son, and I sanctified him unto myself unto all eternity, him and the Sabbath, that he keep the Sabbath and hallow it from all work. For Adam the Sabbath had a peculiar significance. When he was made to depart out of paradise in the twilight of the Sabbath eve, the angels called after him. Adam did not abide in his glory overnight. Then the Sabbath appeared before God as Adam's defender, and he spoke, 
O Lord of the world, during the six working days no creature was slain. If thou wilt begin now by slaying Adam, what will become of the sanctity and the blessing of the Sabbath? In this way Adam was rescued from the fires of hell, the meet punishment for his sins, and in gratitude he composed a psalm in honor of the Sabbath, which David later embodied in his Psalter. Still another opportunity was given to Adam to learn and appreciate the value of the Sabbath, the celestial light whereby Adam could survey the world from end to end, should properly have been made to disappear immediately after his sin. But out of consideration for the Sabbath, God had let this light continue to shine, and the angels at sundown on the sixth day intoned a song of praise and thanksgiving to God for the radiant light shining through the night. Only with the going out of the Sabbath day the celestial light ceased, to the consternation of Adam, who feared that the serpent would attack him in the dark. But God illumined his understanding, and he learned to rub two stones against each other and produce light for his needs. The celestial light was but one of the seven precious gifts enjoyed by Adam before the fall, and to be granted to man again only in the messianic time. The others are the resplendence of his countenance, life eternal, his tall stature, the fruits of the soil, the fruits of the tree, and the luminaries of the sky, the sun and the moon, for in the world to come the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg, Adam's Repentance Cast out of paradise, Adam and Eve built a hut for themselves, and for seven days they sat in it in great distress, mourning and lamenting. At the end of the seven days, tormented by hunger, they came forth and sought food. For seven other days Adam journeyed up and down in the land, looking for such dainties as he had enjoyed in paradise. In vain, he found nothing. Then Eve spoke to her husband, My lord, if it please thee, slay me. Mayhap God will then take thee back into paradise, for the Lord God became wroth with thee only on account of me. But Adam rejected her plan with abhorrence, and both went forth again in the search for food. Nine days passed, and still they found naught resembling what they had had in paradise. They saw only food fit for cattle and beasts. Then Adam proposed, Let us do penance. Mayhap the Lord God will forgive us and have pity on us and give us something to sustain our life. Knowing that Eve was not vigorous enough to undergo the mortification of the flesh which he proposed to inflict upon himself, he prescribed a penance for her different from his own. He said to her, Arise and go to the Tigris, take a stone and stand upon it in the deepest part of the river, where the water will reach as high as thy neck, and let no speech issue forth from thy mouth, for we are unworthy to supplicate God. Our lips are unclean by reason of the forbidden fruit of the tree. Remain in the water for thirty-seven days. For himself Adam ordained forty days of fasting, while he stood in the river Jordan, in the same way as Eve was to take up her stand in the water of the Tigris. After he had adjusted the stone in the middle of the Jordan, and mounted it, with the water surging up to his neck, he said, I adjure thee, O thou water of the Jordan, afflict thyself with me, and gather unto me all swimming creatures that live in thee. Let them surround me, and sorrow with me, and let them not beat their own breasts with grief, but let them beat me. Not they have sinned, only I alone." Very soon they all came, the dwellers in the Jordan, and they encompassed him, and from that moment the water of the Jordan stood still and ceased from flowing. The penance which Adam and Eve laid upon themselves awakened misgivings in Satan. He feared God might forgive their sin, and therefore essayed to hinder Eve in her purpose. After a lapse of eighteen days he appeared unto her in the guise of an angel. As though in distress on account of her, he began to cry, saying, Step up out of the river, and weep no longer. The Lord God hath heard your mourning, and your penitence hath been accepted by him. All the angels supplicated the Lord in your behalf, and he hath sent me to fetch you out of the water, and give you the sustenance that you enjoyed in paradise, and for which you have been mourning. 
enfeebled as she was by her penances and mortifications eve yielded to the solicitations of satan and he led her to where her husband was adam recognized him at once and amid tears he cried out o eve eve where now is thy penitence how couldst thou let our adversary seduce thee again him who robbed us of our sojourn in paradise and all spiritual joy thereupon eve too began to weep and cry out woe unto thee o satan why strivest thou against us without any reason what have we done unto thee that thou shouldst pursue us so craftily with a deep-fetched sigh satan told them how that adam of whom he had been jealous had been the real reason of his fall having lost his glory through him he had intrigued to have him driven from paradise when adam heard the confession of satan he prayed to god o lord my god in thy hands is my life remove from me this adversary who seeks to deliver my soul to destruction and grant me the glory he has forfeited satan disappeared forthwith but adam continued his penance standing in the waters of the jordan for forty days while adam stood in the river he noticed that the days were growing shorter and he feared the world might be darkened on account of his sin and go under soon to avert the doom he spent eight days in prayer and fasting but after the winter solstice when he saw that the days grew longer again he spent eight days in rejoicing and in the following year he celebrated both periods the one before and the one after the solstice this is why the heathen celebrate the calends and the saturnalia in honor of their gods though adam had consecrated those days to the honor of god the first time adam witnessed the sinking of the sun he was also seized with anxious fears it happened at the conclusion of the sabbath and adam said woe is me for my sake because i have sinned the world is darkened and it will again become void and without form thus will be executed the punishment of death which god has pronounced against me all the night he spent in tears and eve too wept as she sat opposite to him when day began to dawn he understood that what he had deplored was but the course of nature and he brought an offering unto god a unicorn whose horn was created before his hoofs and he sacrificed it on the spot on which later the altar was to stand in jerusalem the legends of the jews volume one by rabbi lewis ginsburg the book of raziel after adam's expulsion from paradise he prayed to god in these words o god lord of the world thou didst create the whole world unto the honour and glory of the mighty one and thou didst as was pleasing unto thee thy kingdom is unto all eternity and thy reign unto all generations naught is hidden from thee and naught is concealed from thine eyes thou didst create me as thy handiwork and didst make me the ruler over thy creatures that i might be the chief of thy works but the cunning accursed serpent seduced me with the tree of desire and lusts yea he seduced the wife of my bosom but thou didst not make known unto me what shall befall my children and the generations after me i know well that no human being can be righteous in thine eyes and what is my strength that i should step before thee with an impudent face i have no mouth wherewith to speak and no eye wherewith to see for i did sin and commit a trespass and by reason of my sins i was driven forth from paradise i must plough the earth whence i was taken and the other inhabitants of the earth the beasts no longer as once stand in awe and fear of me from the time i ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil wisdom departed from me and i am a fool that knoweth not an ignorant man that understandeth not now o merciful and gracious god i pray to thee to turn again thy compassion to the head of thy works to the spirit which thou didst instill into him and the soul thou didst breathe into him meet me with thy grace for thou art gracious slow to anger and full of love o oh, that my prayer would reach unto the throne of thy glory and my supplication unto the throne of thy mercy and thou wouldst incline to me with loving kindness may the words of my mouth be acceptable that thou turn not away from my petition thou wert from everlasting and thou wilt be unto everlasting thou wert king and thou wilt ever be king 
Now have thou mercy upon the work of thy hands. Grant me knowledge and understanding, that I may know what shall befall me, and my posterity, and all the generations that come after me, and what shall befall me on every day, and in every month, and mayest thou not withhold from me the help of thy servants and of thy angels. On the third day after he had offered up this prayer, while he was sitting on the banks of the river that flows forth out of paradise, there appeared to him in the heat of the day the angel Raziel, bearing a book in his hand. The angel addressed Adam thus, O Adam, why art thou so faint-hearted? Why art thou distressed and anxious? Thy words were heard at the moment when thou didst utter thy supplication and entreaties, and I have received the charge to teach thee pure words and deep understanding, to make thee wise through the contents of the sacred book in my hand, to know what will happen to thee until the day of thy death. And all thy descendants and all the later generations, if they will but read this book in purity, with a devout heart and a humble mind, and obey its precepts, will become like unto thee. They too will foreknow what things shall happen, and in what month, and on what day, or in what night, all will be manifest to them. They will know and understand whether a calamity will come, a famine or wild beasts, floods or drought, whether there will be abundant grain or dearth, whether the wicked will rule the world, whether locusts will devastate the land, whether the fruits will drop from the trees unripe, whether boils will afflict men, whether wars will prevail or diseases or plagues among men and cattle, whether good is resolved upon in heaven or evil, whether blood will flow and the death-rattle of the slain be heard in the city, and now, Adam, come, and give heed unto what I shall tell thee regarding the manner of this book and its holiness. Raziel the angel then read from the book, and when Adam heard the words of the holy volume as they issued from the mouth of the angel, he fell down affrighted, but the angel encouraged him. Arise, Adam, he said, be of good courage, be not afraid. Take the book from me, and keep it, for thou wilt draw knowledge from it thyself, and become wise, and thou wilt also teach its contents to all those who shall be found worthy of knowing what it contains. In the moment when Adam took the book, a flame of fire shot up from near the river, and the angel rose heavenward with it. Then Adam knew that he who had spoken to him was an angel of God, and it was from the holy king himself that the book had come, and he used it in holiness and purity. It is the book out of which all things worth knowing can be learnt, and all mysteries, and it teaches also how to call upon the angels, and make them appear before men, and answer all their questions. But not all alike can use the book, only he who is wise and God-fearing, and resorts to it in holiness. Such an one is secure against all wicked counsels, his life is serene, and when death takes him from this world he finds repose in a place where there are neither demons nor evil spirits, and out of the hands of the wicked he is quickly rescued. End of chapter 2, part 5 Recorded by Brian Ness Six of the Legend of the Jews by Rabbi Louis Ginsberg Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Legends of the Jews by Rabbi Louis Ginsberg. Chapter 2, Part 6. The Sickness of Adam. When Adam had lived to be nine hundred and thirty years old, a sickness seized him, and he felt that his days were drawing to an end. He summoned all his descendants, and assembled them before the doors of the house of worship in which he had always offered his prayers to God, to give them his last blessing. His family were astonished to find him stretched out on the bed of sickness, for they did not know what pain and suffering were. They thought he was overcome with longing after the fruits of paradise, and for lack of them was depressed. Set announced his willingness to go to the gates of paradise, and begged God to let one of his angels give him of its fruits. But Adam explained to them what sickness and pain are, and that God had inflicted them upon him as a punishment for his sin. Adam suffered violently. Tears and groans were wrung from him. Eve sobbed and said, Adam, my lord, give me half of thy sickness. I will gladly bear it. Is it not on account of me that this hath come upon thee? On account of me thou undergoest pain and anguish. 
Adam bade Eve go with Seth to the gates of paradise and entreat God to have mercy upon him, and send his angel to catch up some of the oil of life flowing from the tree of his mercy, and give it to his messengers. The ointment would bring him rest, and banish the pain consuming him. On his way to paradise, Seth was attacked by a wild beast. Eve called out to the assailant, How durst thou lay hand on the image of God? The ready answer came, It is thine own fault. Hadst thou not opened thy mouth to eat of the forbidden fruit, my mouth would not be opened now to destroy a human being. But Seth remonstrated, Hold thy tongue, desist from the image of God until the day of judgment. And the beast gave way, saying, See, I refrain myself from the image of God. And it slunk away to its covert. Arrived at the gates of paradise, even Seth began to cry bitterly, and they besought God with many lamentations to give them oil from the tree of his mercy. For hours they prayed thus. At last the archangel Michael appeared, and informed them that he came as the messenger of God to tell them that their petition could not be granted. Adam would die in a few days, and as he was subject to death, so would be all his descendants. Only at the time of the resurrection, and then only to the pious, the oil of life would be dispensed, together with all the bliss and all the delights of paradise. Returned to Adam, they reported what had happened, and he said to Eve, What misfortune didst thou bring upon us when thou didst arouse great wrath? See, death is the portion of all our race. Call hither our children and our children's children, and tell them the manner of our sinning. And while Adam lay prostrate upon the bed of pain, Eve told them the story of their fall. The Legends of the Jews by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg Eve's Story of the Fall after I was created, God divided paradise and all the animals therein between Adam and me. The east and the north were assigned to Adam together with the male animals. I was mistress of the west and the south, and all the female animals. Satan, smarting under the disgrace of having been dismissed from the heavenly host, resolved to bring about our ruin and avenge himself upon the cause of his discomfiture. He won the serpent over to his side, and pointed out to him that before the creation of Adam, the animals could enjoy all that grew in paradise, and now they were restricted to the weeds. To drive Adam from paradise would therefore be for the good of all. The Satan demurred, for he stood in awe of the wrath of God. But Satan calmed his fears, and said, Do thou but become my vessel, and I shall speak a word through thy mouth, wherewith thou wilt succeed in seducing man. The serpent thereupon suspended himself from the wall surrounding paradise to carry on his conversation with me from without. And this happened at the very moment when my two guardian angels had betaken themselves to heaven to supplicate the Lord. I was quite alone, therefore, and when Satan assumed the appearance of an angel bent over the wall of paradise, and intoned seraphic songs of praise, I was deceived, and thought him an angel. A conversation was held between us, Satan speaking through the mouth of the serpent. Art thou Eve? Yes, it is I. What art thou doing in paradise? The Lord has put us here to cultivate it, and eat of its fruits. That is good. Yet you eat not of all the trees. That we do, excepting a single one, the tree that stands in the midst of paradise. Concerning it alone, God has forbidden us to eat of it. Else, the Lord said, you will die. The serpent made every effort to persuade me that I had naught to fear, that God knew that in the day that Adam and I ate of the fruit of the tree we should be as he himself. It was jealousy that had made him say, You shall not eat of it. In spite of all his urging, I remained steadfast, and refused to touch the tree. Then the serpent engaged to pluck the fruit for me. Thereupon I opened the gate of paradise, and he slipped in. Scarcely was he within when he said to me, I have repented of my words. I would rather not give thee of the fruit of the forbidden tree was but a cunning device to tempt me more. He consented to give me of the fruit only after I swore to make my husband eat of it, too. This is the oath he made me take. By the throne of God, by the cherubim, and by the tree of life, I shall give my husband of this fruit, that he may eat, too. Thereupon the serpent ascended the tree, and injected his poison, the poison of evil inclination, into the fruit, and bent the branch on which it grew to the ground. I took hold of it, but I knew at once that I was stripped of the righteousness in which I had been clothed. I began to weep, because of it and because of the oath the serpent had forced from me. The serpent disappeared from the tree, while I sought leaves wherewith to cover my nakedness, but all the trees within my reach had cast off their leaves at the moment when I ate of the forbidden fruit. There was only one that retained its leaves, the fig tree, the very tree, the fruit of which had been forbidden to me. I summoned Adam, and by means of blasphemous words I prevailed upon him to eat of the fruit. 
As soon as it had passed his lips, he knew his true condition, and he exclaimed against me, Thou wicked woman, what hast thou brought down upon me? Thou hast removed me from the glory of God. At the same time, Adam and I heard the archangel Michael blow his trumpet, and all the angels cried out, Thus saith the Lord, Come ye with me to paradise, and hearken unto the sentence which I will pronounce on Adam. We hid ourselves, because we feared the judgment of God. Sitting in his chariot, drawn by cherubim, the Lord, accompanied by angels uttering his praise, appeared in paradise. At his coming, the bare trees again put forth leaves. His throne was erected by the tree of life, and God addressed Adam. Adam, where dost thou keep thyself in hiding? Thinkest thou I cannot find thee? Can a house conceal itself from its architect? Adam tried to put the blame on me, who had promised to hold him harmless before God, and I in turn accused the serpent. But God dealt out justice to all three of us. To Adam he said, Because thou didst not obey my commands, but did hearken unto the voice of thy wife, cursed is the ground in spite of thy work. When thou dost cultivate it, it will not yield thee its strength. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Thou wilt suffer many a hardship, thou wilt grow weary and find no rest. Bitterly oppressed, thou shalt never taste of any sweetness. Thou shalt toil greatly, and yet not gain wealth. Thou shalt grow fat, and yet cease to live. And the animals over which thou art the master will rise up against thee, because thou didst not keep my command. Upon me God pronounced this sentence. Thou shalt suffer anguish in childbirth and grievous torture. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. And in the hour of travail, when thou art near to lose thy life, thou wilt confess and cry, Lord, Lord, save me this time, and I shall never again indulge in carnal pleasure and yet thy desire shall ever and ever be unto thy husband. At the same time all sorts of diseases were decreed upon us. God said to Adam, Because thou didst turn thy face from my covenant, I will inflict seventy plagues upon thy flesh. The pain of the first plague shall lay hold on thy eyes, the pain of the second plague upon thy hearing, and one after the other all the plagues shall come upon thee. The serpent God addressed thus, because thou becamest the vessel of the evil one, deceiving the innocent, cursed art thou above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Thou shalt be robbed of the food thou wast wont to eat, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Upon thy breast and thy belly shalt thou go, and of thy hands and of thy feet thou shalt be deprived. Thou shalt not remain in possession of thy ears, nor of thy wings, nor of any of thy limbs wherewith thou didst seduce the woman and her husband, bringing them to such a pass that they must be driven forth from paradise." and I will put enmity between thee and the seed of man. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel, until the day of judgment. The Legends of the Jews by Rabbi Louis Ginsberg The Death of Adam On the last day of Adam's life, Eve said to him, Why should I go on living when thou art no more? How long shall I have to linger on after thy death? Tell me this. Adam assured her she would not tarry long. They would die together, and be buried together in the same place. He commanded her not to touch his corpse until an angel from God had made provision regarding it, and she was to begin at once to pray to God until his soul escaped from his body. While Eve was on her knees in prayer, an angel came and bade her rise. Eve, arise from thy penance, he commanded. Behold, thy husband has left his mortal coil. Arise, and see his spirit go up to his Creator to appear before him. And, lo, she beheld a chariot of light, drawn by four shining eagles, and preceded by angels. In this chariot lay the soul of Adam, which the angels were taking to heaven. Arrived there, they burnt incense until the clouds of smoke enveloped the heavens. Then they prayed to God to have mercy upon his image and the work of his holy hands. In her awe and fright, Eve summoned Seth, and bade him look upon the vision and explain the celestial sights beyond her understanding. She asked, Who may the two Ethiopians be, who are adding their prayers to thy fathers? Seth told her they were the sun and moon, turned black because they could not shine in the face of the Father of Light. Scarcely had he spoken, when an angel blew a trumpet, and all the angels cried with awful voices, Blessed be the glory of the Lord by his creatures, for he has shown mercy unto Adam, the work of his hands. A seraph then seized Adam, and carried him off to the river Acheron, washed him three times, and brought him before the presence of God, who sat upon his throne, and stretching out his hand lifted Adam up, and gave him over to the archangel Michael with the words, Raise him to the paradise of the third heaven, and there shalt thou leave him until the great and fearful day ordained by me. Michael executed the divine behest, and all the angels sang a song of praise, extolling God for the pardon he had accorded Adam. 
Mikhail now entreated God to let him attend to the preparation of Adam's body for the grave. Permission being given, Mikhail repaired to earth, accompanied by all the angels. When they entered the terrestrial paradise, all the trees blossomed forth, and the perfume wafted thence lulled all men into slumber except Seth alone. Then God said to Adam, as his body lay on the ground, If thou hadst kept my commandment, they would not rejoice who brought thee hither. But I tell thee, I will turn the joy of Satan and his consorts into sorrow, and thy sorrow shall be turned into joy. I will restore thee to thy dominion, and thou shalt sit upon the throne of thy seducer, while he shall be damned with those who hearken unto him. Thereupon, at the bidding of God, the three great archangels covered the body of Adam with linen, and poured sweet-smelling oil upon it. With it they interred also the body of Abel, who had laid unburied since Cain had slain him, for all the murderer's efforts to hide it had been in vain. The corpse again and again sprang forth from the earth, and a voice issued thence, proclaiming, No creature shall rest in the earth until the first one of all has returned the dust to me of which it was formed. The angels carried the two bodies to paradise, Adam's and Abel's. The latter in all this time had been lying on a stone on which angels had placed it, and there they buried them both on the spot whence God had taken the dust wherewith to make Adam. God called unto the body of Adam, 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 and it answered, Lord, here am I. Then God said, I told thee once, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now I promise thee resurrection. I will awaken thee on the day of judgment, when all the generations of men that spring from thy loins shall arise from the grave. God then sealed up the grave, that none might do him harm during the six days to elapse, until his rib should be restored to him, through the death of Eve. The Legends of the Jews by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg The Death of Eve the interval between Adam's death and her own, Eve spent in weeping. She was distressed in particular that she knew not what had become of Adam's body, for none except Seth had been awake while the angels interred it. When the hour of her death drew nigh, Eve supplicated to be buried in the self-same spot in which the remains of her husband rested. She prayed to God, Lord of all power, remove not thy maidservant from the body of Adam, from which thou didst take me, from whose limbs thou didst form me. Permit me, who am an unworthy and sinning woman, to enter into his habitation. As we were together in paradise, neither separated from the other, as together we were tempted to transgress thy law, neither separated from the other, so, O Lord, separate not us now. To the end of her prayer she added the petition, raising her eyes heavenward, Lord of the world, receive my spirit, and she gave up her soul to God. The archangel Michael came and taught Seth how to prepare Eve for burial, and three angels descended and interred her body in the grave with Adam and Abel. Then Michael spoke to Seth, Thus shalt thou bury all men that die until the resurrection day. And again, having given him this command, he spoke, Longer than six days you shall not mourn. The repose of the seventh day is the token of resurrection in the latter day, for on the seventh day the Lord rested from all the work which he had created and made. Though death was brought into the world through Adam, yet he cannot be held responsible for the death of men. Once on a time he said to God, I am not concerned about the death of the wicked, but I should not like the pious to reproach me and lay the blame for their death upon me. I pray thee, make no mention of my guilt. And as God promised to fulfill his wish, therefore when a man is about to die, God appears to him, and bids him set down in writing all he has done during his life, for he tells him, Thou art dying by reason of thy evil deeds." The record finished, God orders him to seal it with his seal. This is the writing God will bring out on the judgment day, and to each will be made known his deeds. As soon as life is extinct in a man, he is presented to Adam, whom he accuses of having caused his death. But Adam repudiates the charge. I committed but one trespass. Is there any among you, and be he the most pious, who has not been guilty of more than one? End of chapter 2, part 6《Chapter Three: The Death of Eve, Part One of the Legends of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Brian Ness. • The Legends of the Jews, Volume One by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg. The Ten Generations. The Birth of Cain. 
There were ten generations, from Adam to Noah, to show how long-suffering is the Lord, for all the generations provoked him unto wrath, until he brought the deluge upon them. By reason of their impiousness, God changed his plan of calling one thousand generations into being, between the creation of the world and the revelation of the law at Mount Sinai, nine hundred and seventy-four he suppressed before the flood. Wickedness came into the world with the first being born of woman, Cain, the oldest son of Adam. When God bestowed paradise upon the first pair of mankind, He warned them particularly against carnal intercourse with each other. But after the fall of Eve, Satan, in the guise of the serpent, approached her, and the fruit of their union was Cain, the ancestor of all the impious generations that were rebellious toward God, and rose up against him. Cain's descent from Satan, who is the angel Samael, was revealed in his seraphic appearance. At his birth the exclamation was wrung from Eve, I have gotten a man through an angel of the Lord. Adam was not in the company of Eve during the time of her pregnancy with Cain. After she had succumbed a second time to the temptations of Satan, and permitted herself to be interrupted in her penance, she left her husband and journeyed westward, because she feared her presence might continue to bring him misery. Adam remained in the east. When the days of Eve to be delivered were fulfilled, and she began to feel the pangs of travailing, she prayed to God for help, but he hearkened not unto her supplications. Who will carry the report to my lord Adam? she asked herself. Ye luminaries in the sky, I beg you, tell it to my master Adam when you return to the east. In that selfsame hour Adam cried out, The lamentation of Eve has pierced to my ear. Mayhap the serpent has again assaulted her. And he hastened to his wife. Finding her in grievous pain, he besought God in her behalf, and twelve angels appeared, together with two heavenly powers. All these took up their post to right of her and to left of her, while Michael, also standing on her right side, passed his hand over her, from her face downward to her breast, and said to her, Be thou blessed, Eve, for the sake of Adam. Because of his solicitations and his prayers, I was sent to grant thee our assistance. Make ready to give birth to thy child. Immediately her son was born, a radiant figure. A little while, and the babe stood upon his feet, ran off, and returned, holding in his hands a stalk of straw, which he gave to his mother. For this reason he was named Cain, the Hebrew word for stock of straw. Now Adam took Eve and the boy to his home in the east. God sent him various kinds of seeds by the hand of the angel Michael, and he was taught how to cultivate the ground and make it yield produce and fruits to sustain himself and his family and his posterity. After a while Eve bore her second son, whom she named Hebel because, she said, he was born but to die. Fratricide The slaying of Abel by Cain did not come as a wholly unexpected event to his parents. In a dream Eve had seen the blood of Abel flow into the mouth of Cain, who drank it with avidity, though his brother entreated him not to take all. When she told her dream to Adam, he said, lamenting, Oh, that this may not portend the death of Abel at the hand of Cain! He separated the two lads, assigning to each an abode of his own, and to each he taught a different occupation. Cain became a tiller of the ground, and Abel a keeper of sheep. It was all in vain. In spite of these precautions, Cain slew his brother. His hostility toward Abel had more than one reason. It began when God had respect unto the offering of Abel, and accepted it by sending heavenly fire down to consume it, while the offering of Cain was rejected. They brought their sacrifices on the fourteenth day of Nisan, at the instance of their father, who had spoken thus to his sons, This is the day on which, in times to come, Israel will offer sacrifices. Therefore do ye, too, bring sacrifices to your Creator on this day, that he may take pleasure in you. The place of offering which they chose was the spot whereon the altar of the temple at Jerusalem stood later. Abel selected the best of his flocks for his sacrifice, but Cain 
ate his meal first, and after he had satisfied his appetite, he offered unto God what was left over, a few grains of flaxseed. As though his offense had not been great enough in offering unto God fruit of the ground which had been cursed by God, what wonder that his sacrifice was not received with favor? Besides, a chastisement was inflicted upon him. His face turned black as smoke. Nevertheless, his disposition underwent no change even when God spoke to him thus, If thou wilt amend thy ways, thy guilt will be forgiven thee. If not, thou wilt be delivered into the power of the evil inclination. It coucheth at the door of thy heart, yet it depends upon thee whether thou shalt be master over it, or it shall be master over thee. Cain thought he had been wronged, and a dispute followed between him and Abel. I believed, he said, that the world was created through goodness, but I see that good deeds bear no fruit. God rules the world with arbitrary power, else why had he respect unto thy offering, and not unto mine also? Abel opposed him. He maintained that God rewards good deeds, without having respect unto persons. If his sacrifice had been accepted graciously by God, and Cain's not, it was because his deeds were good and his brother's wicked. But this was not the only cause of Cain's hatred toward Abel. Partly love for a woman brought about the crime. To ensure the propagation of the human race, a girl destined to be his wife was born together with each of the sons of Adam. Abel's twin sister was of exquisite beauty, and Cain desired her. Therefore he was constantly brooding over ways and means of ridding himself of his brother. The opportunity presented itself ere long. One day a sheep belonging to Abel tramped over a field that had been planted by Cain. In a rage the latter called out, What right hast thou to live upon my land, and let thy sheep pasture yonder? Abel retorted, what right hast thou to use the products of my sheep to make garments for thyself from their wool? If thou wilt take off the wool of my sheep wherein thou art arrayed, and wilt pay me for the flesh of the flocks which thou hast eaten, then I will quit thy land as thou desirest, and fly into the air if I can do it. Cain thereupon said, And if I were to kill thee, who is there to demand thy blood of me? Abel replied, God, who brought us into the world, will avenge me. He will require my blood at thine hand, if thou shouldst slay me. God is the judge, who will visit their wicked deeds upon the wicked, and their evil deeds upon the evil. Shouldst thou slay me, God will know thy secret, and he will deal out punishment unto thee. These words but added to the anger of Cain, and he threw himself upon his brother. Abel was stronger than he, and he would have got the worst of it, but at the last moment he begged for mercy, and the gentle Abel released his hold upon him. Scarcely did he feel himself free when he turned against Abel once more and slew him. So true is the saying, Do the evil no good, lest evil fall upon thee. THE PUNISHMENT OF CAIN the manner of Abel's death was the most cruel conceivable. Not knowing what injury was fatal, Cain pelted all parts of his body with stones, until one struck him on the neck and inflicted death. After committing the murder, Cain resolved to flee, saying, My parents will demand account of me concerning Abel, for there is no other human being on earth. This thought had but passed through his mind when God appeared unto him, and addressed him in these words. Before thy parents thou canst flee, but canst thou go out from my presence too? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Alas, for Abel, that he showed thee mercy, and refrained from killing thee when he had thee in his power. Alas, that he granted thee the opportunity of slaying him. Questioned by God, Where is Abel thy brother? Cain answered, Am I my brother's keeper? Thou art he who holdest watch over all creatures, and yet thou demandest account of me? True, I slew him, but thou didst create the evil inclination in me. Thou guardest all things. Why then didst thou permit me to slay him? Thou didst thyself slay him, for hadst thou looked with a favorable countenance toward my offering as toward his, I had had no reason for envying him, and had not slain him. But God said, 
The voice of thy brother's blood, issuing from his many wounds, crieth out against thee, and likewise the blood of all the pious who might have sprung from the loins of Abel. Also the soul of Abel denounced the murderer, for she could find rest nowhere. She could neither soar heavenward, nor abide in the grave with her body, for no human soul had done either before. But Cain still refused to confess his guilt. He insisted that he had never seen a man killed, and how was he to suppose that the stones which he threw at Abel would take his life? Then, on account of Cain, God cursed the ground, that it might not yield fruit unto him. With a single punishment both Cain and the earth were chastised, the earth because it retained the corpse of Abel, and did not cast it above ground. In the obduracy of his heart Cain spoke, O Lord of the world, are there informers who denounce men before thee? My parents are the only living human beings, and they know not of my deed. Thou abidest in the heavens, and how shouldest thou know what things happen on earth? God said in reply, Thou fool! I carry the whole world, I have made it, and I will bear it, a reply that gave Cain the opportunity of feigning repentance. Thou bearest the whole world, he said, and my sin thou canst not bear? Verily mine iniquity is too great to be borne, yet yesterday thou didst banish my father from thy presence, to-day thou dost banish me. In sooth it will be said, it is thy way to banish." Although this was but dissimulation, and not true repentance, God granted Cain pardon, and removed the half of his chastisement from him. Originally the decree had condemned him to be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Now he was no longer to roam about for ever, but a fugitive he was to remain, and so much was hard enough to have to suffer, for the earth quaked under Cain, and all the animals, the wild and the tame, among them the accursed serpent, gathered together and essayed to devour him in order to avenge the innocent blood of Abel. Finally Cain could bear it no longer, and breaking out in tears he cried, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? To protect him from the onslaught of the beasts, God inscribed one letter of his holy name upon his forehead, and furthermore he addressed the animals. Cain's punishment shall not be like unto the punishment of future murderers. He has shed blood, but there was none to give him instruction. Henceforth, however, he who slays another shall himself be slain. Then God gave him the dog as a protection against the wild beasts, and to mark him as a sinner he afflicted him with leprosy. Cain's repentance, insincere though it was, bore a good result. When Adam met him, and inquired what doom had been decreed against him, Cain told him his repentance had propitiated God, and Adam exclaimed, So potent is repentance, and I knew it not. Thereupon he composed a hymn of praise to God, beginning with the words, It is a good thing to confess thy sins unto the Lord. The crime committed by Cain had baneful consequences, not for himself alone, but for the whole of nature also. Before the fruits which the earth bore unto him, when he tilled the ground, had tasted like the fruits of paradise. Now his labor produced naught but thorns and thistles. The ground changed and deteriorated at the very moment of Abel's violent end. The trees and the plants in the part of the earth whereon the victim lived refused to yield their fruits on account of their grief over him, and only at the birth of Seth, those that grew in the portion belonging to Abel began to flourish and bear again. But never did they resume their former powers, while before the vine had borne nine hundred and twenty-six different varieties of fruit, it now brought forth but one kind, and so it was with all other species. They will regain their pristine powers only in the world to come. Nature was modified also by the burial of the corpse of Abel. For a long time it lay there exposed above ground, because Adam and Eve knew not what to do with it. They sat beside it and wept, while the faithful dog of Abel kept guard that birds and beasts did it no harm. On a sudden the mourning parents observed how a raven scratched the earth away in one spot, and then hid a dead bird of his own kind in the ground. Adam, following the example of the raven, buried the body of Abel, and the raven was rewarded by God. 
His young are born with white feathers, wherefore the old birds desert them, not recognizing them as their offspring. They take them for serpents. God feeds them until their plumage turns black, and the parent birds return to them. As an additional reward, God grants their petition when the ravens pray for rain. THE INHABITANTS OF THE SEVEN EARTHS When Adam was cast out of paradise, he first reached the lowest of the seven earths, the Eres, which is dark, without a ray of light, and utterly void. Adam was terrified, particularly by the flames of the ever-turning sword, which is on this earth. After he had done penance, God led him to the second earth, the Adama, where there is light reflected from its own sky and from its phantom-like stars and constellations. Here dwell the phantom-like beings that issued from the union of Adam with the spirits. They are always sad. The emotion of joy is not known to them. They leave their own earth and repair to the one inhabited by men, where they are changed into evil spirits. Then they return to their abode for good, repent of their wicked deeds, and till the ground, which, however, bears neither wheat nor any other of the seven species. In this Adama, Cain, Abel, and Seth were born. After the murder of Abel, Cain was sent back to the Eris, where he was frightened into repentance by its darkness and by the flames of the ever-turning sword. Accepting his penance, God permitted him to ascend to the third earth, the Arca, which receives some light from the sun. The Arca was surrendered to the Cainites forever as their perpetual domain. They till the ground and plant trees, but they have neither wheat nor any other of the seven species. Some of the Cainites are giants, some of them are dwarfs. They have two heads, wherefore they can never arrive at a decision. They are always at loggerheads with themselves. It may happen that they are pious now, only to be inclined to do evil the next moment. In the Ge, the fourth earth, lived the generation of the Tower of Babel and their descendants. God banished them thither, because the fourth earth is not far from Gehenna, and therefore close to the flaming fire. The inhabitants of the Ge are skillful in all arts, and accomplished in all departments of science and knowledge, and their abode overflows with wealth. When an inhabitant of our earth visits them, they give him the most precious thing in their possession, but then they lead him to the Neshia, the fifth earth, where he becomes oblivious of his origin and his home. The Neshia is inhabited by dwarfs without noses. They breathe through two holes instead. They have no memory. Once a thing has happened, they forget it completely, whence their earth is called Neshia, forgetting. The fourth and fifth earths are like the Arca, they have trees, but neither wheat nor any other of the seven species. The sixth earth, the Zia, is inhabited by handsome men who are the owners of abundant wealth and live in palatial residences. But they lack water, as the name of their territory, Zia, drought, indicates. Hence vegetation is sparse with them, and their tree culture meets with indifferent success. They hasten to any water spring that is discovered, and sometimes they succeed in slipping through it up to our earth, where they satisfy their sharp appetite for the food eaten by the inhabitants of our earth. For the rest, they are men of steadfast faith, more than any other class of humankind. Adam remained in the Adama until after the birth of Seth, then passing the third earth, the Arca, the abiding place of the Cainites, and the next three earths as well, the Ge, the Neshia, and the Zia, God transported him to the Tebel, the seventh earth, the earth inhabited by men. End of chapter 3, part 1Chapter 3, The Death of Eve, Part 2, of The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Brian Ness. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1, by Rabbi Louis Ginsberg. The Descendants of Cain. 
Cain knew only too well that his blood-guiltiness would be visited upon him in the seventh generation. Thus had God decreed against him. He endeavored, therefore, to immortalize his name by means of monuments, and he became a builder of cities. The first of them he called Enoch, after his son, because it was at the birth of Enoch that he began to enjoy a measure of rest and peace. Besides, he founded six other cities. This building of cities was a godless deed, for he surrounded them with a wall, forcing his family to remain within. All his other doings were equally impious. The punishment God had ordained for him did not affect any improvement. He sinned in order to secure his own pleasure, though his neighbors suffered injury thereby. He augmented his household substance by rapine and violence. He excited his acquaintances to procure pleasures and spoils by robbery, and he became a great leader of men into wicked courses. He also introduced a change in the ways of simplicity wherein men had lived before, and he was the author of Measures and Weights. And whereas men lived innocently and generously while they knew nothing of such arts, he changed the world into cunning craftiness. Like unto Cain were all his descendants, impious and godless, wherefore God resolved to destroy them. The end of Cain overtook him in the seventh generation of men, and it was inflicted upon him by the hand of his great-grandson Lamech. This Lamech was blind, and when he went a-hunting, he was led by his young son, who would apprise his father when game came in sight, and Lamech would then shoot at it with his bow and arrow. Once upon a time he and his son went on the chase, and the lad discerned something horned in the distance. He naturally took it to be a beast of one kind or another, and he told the blind Lamech to let his arrow fly. The aim was good, and the quarry dropped to the ground. When they came close to the victim, the lad exclaimed, Father, thou hast killed something that resembles a human being in all respects, except it carries a horn on its forehead. Lamech knew at once what had happened. He had killed his ancestor Cain, who had been marked by God with a horn. In despair he smote his hands together, inadvertently killing his son as he clasped them. Misfortune still followed upon misfortune. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the four generations sprung from Cain, Enoch, Irad, Mehujael, and Methusael. Lamech, sightless as he was, could not go home. He had to remain by the side of Cain's corpse and his son's. Toward evening his wives, seeking him, found him there. When they heard what he had done, they wanted to separate from him, all the more as they knew that whoever was descended from Cain was doomed to annihilation. But Lamech argued, if Cain, who committed murder of malice aforethought, was punished only in the seventh generation, then I, who had no intention of killing a human being, may hope that retribution will be averted for seventy and seven generations. With his wives, Lamech repaired to Adam, who heard both parties, and decided the case in favor of Lamech. The corruptness of the times, and especially the depravity of Cain's stock, appears in the fact that Lamech, as well as all the men in the generation of the deluge, married two wives, one with the purpose of rearing children, the other in order to pursue carnal indulgences, for which reason the latter was rendered sterile by artificial means. As the men of the time were intent upon pleasure rather than desirous of doing their duty to the human race, they gave all their love and attention to the barren women, while their other wives spent their days like widows, joyless and in gloom. The two wives of Lamech, Ada and Zillah, bore him each two children, Ada two sons, Jabal and Jubal, and Zillah a son Tubal-Cain, and a daughter, Nama. Jabal was the first among men to erect temples to idols, and Jubal invented the music sung and played therein. Tubal-Cain was rightly named, for he completed the work of his ancestor Cain. Cain committed murder, and Tubal-Cain, the first who knew how to sharpen iron and copper, furnished the instruments used in wars and combats. Nama, the lovely, earned her name from the sweet sounds which she drew from her cymbals when she called the worshippers to pay homage to idols. 
The Descendants of Adam and Lilith When the wives of Lamech heard the decision of Adam, that they were to continue to live with their husband, they turned upon him, saying, O physician, heal thine own lameness. They were alluding to the fact that he himself had been living apart from his wife since the death of Abel, for he had said, Why should I beget children, if it is but to expose them to death? Though he avoided intercourse with Eve, he was visited in his sleep by female spirits, and from his union with them sprang shades and demons of various kinds, and they were endowed with peculiar gifts. Once upon a time there lived in Palestine a very rich and pious man who had a son named Rabbi Hanina. He knew the whole of the Torah by heart. When he was at the point of death, he sent for his son, Rabbi Hanina, and bade him, as his last request, to study the Torah day and night, fulfill the commands of the law, and be a faithful friend to the poor. He also told him that he and his wife, the mother of Rabbi Hanina, would die on the selfsame day, and the seven days of mourning for the two would end on the eve of the Passover. He enjoined him not to grieve excessively, but to go to market on that day, and buy the first article offered to him, no matter how costly it might be. If it happened to be edible, he was to prepare it and serve it with much ceremony. His expense and troubles would receive their recompense. All happened as foretold. The man and his wife died upon the same day, and the end of the week of mourning coincided with the eve of the Passover. The son, in turn, carried out his father's behest. He repaired to market, and there he met an old man who offered a silver dish for sale. Although the price asked was exorbitant, yet he bought it as his father had bidden. The dish was set upon the Seder table, and when Rabbi Hanina opened it, he found a second dish within, and inside of this a live frog, jumping and hopping around gleefully. He gave the frog food and drink, and by the end of the festival he was grown so big that Rabbi Hanina made a cabinet for him, in which he ate and lived. In the course of time the cabinet became too small, and the rabbi built a chamber, put the frog within, and gave him abundant food and drink. All this he did, that he might not violate his father's last wish. But the frog waxed and grew. He consumed all his host owned, until finally Rabbi Hanina was stripped bare of all his possessions. Then the frog opened his mouth and began to speak. My dear Rabbi Hanina, he said, do not worry. Seeing thou didst raise me, and care for me, thou mayest ask of me whatever thy heart desireth, and it shall be granted thee. Rabbi Hanina made reply, I desire not, but that thou shouldest teach me the whole of the Torah. The frog assented, and he did, indeed, teach him the whole of the Torah, and the seventy languages of men besides. His method was to write a few words upon a scrap of paper which he had his pupils swallow. Thus he acquired not alone the Torah and the seventy tongues, but also the language of beasts and birds. Thereupon the frog spoke to the wife of Rabbi Hanina, Thou didst tend me well, and I have given thee no recompense, but thy reward will be paid thee before I depart from you, only you must both accompany me to the woods. There you shall see what I shall do for you. Accordingly they went to the woods with him. Arrived there, the frog began to cry aloud, and at the sound all sorts of beasts and birds assembled. These he commanded to produce precious stones, as many as they could carry. Also they were to bring herbs and roots for the wife of Rabbi Hanina, and he taught her how to use them as remedies for all varieties of disease. All this they were bidden to take home with them. When they were about to return, the frog addressed them thus, May the Holy One, blessed be He, have mercy upon you, and requite you for all the trouble you took on my account, without so much as inquiring who I am. Now I shall make my origin known to you. I am the son of Adam, a son whom he begot during the hundred and thirty years of his separation from Eve. God has endowed me with the power of assuming any form or guise I desire. Rabbi Hanina and his wife departed for their home, and they became very rich, and enjoyed the respect and confidence of the king. Seth and His Descendants 
The exhortations of the wives of Lamech took effect upon Adam. After a separation of one hundred and thirty years, he returned to Eve, and the love he now bore her was stronger by far than in the former time. She was in his thoughts, even when she was not present to him bodily. The fruit of their union was Seth, who was destined to be the ancestor of the Messiah. Seth was so formed from birth that the rite of circumcision could be dispensed with. He was thus one of the thirteen men born perfect in a way. Adam begot him in his likeness and image, different from Cain, who had not been in his likeness and image. Thus Seth became, in a genuine sense, the father of the human race, especially the father of the pious, while the depraved and godless are descended from Cain. Even during the lifetime of Adam, the descendants of Cain became exceedingly wicked, dying successively, one after another, each more wicked than the former. They were intolerable in war, and vehement in robberies, and if any one were slow to murder people, yet was he bold in his profligate behavior and acting unjustly, and doing injury for gain. Now as to Seth, when he was brought up, and came to those years in which he could discern what was good, he became a virtuous man, and as he was himself of excellent character, so he left children behind him, who imitated his virtues. All these proved to be of good disposition. They also inhabited one and the same country without dissensions, and in a happy condition without any misfortunes falling upon them until they died. They also were the inventors of that peculiar sort of wisdom which is concerned with the heavenly bodies and their order, and that their inventions might not be lost before they were sufficiently known, they made two pillars, upon Adam's prediction that the world was to be destroyed at one time by the force of fire, and at another time by the violence and quantity of water. The one was of brick, the other of stone, and they inscribed their discoveries on both, that in case the pillar of brick should be destroyed by the flood, the pillar of stone might remain, and exhibit these discoveries to mankind, and also inform them that there was another pillar of brick erected by them. Enosh Enosh was asked who his father was, and he named Seth. The questioners, the people of his time, continued, Who was the father of Seth? Enosh Adam And who was the father of Adam? He had neither father nor mother. God formed him from the dust of the earth. But man has not the appearance of dust. After death man returns to dust, as God said, and man shall turn again unto dust. But on the day of his creation man was made in the image of God. How was the woman created? Male and female he created them. But how? God took water and earth and molded them together in the form of man. But how? pursued the questioners. Enosh took six clods of earth, mixed them, and molded them, and formed an image of dust and clay. But, said the people, this image does not walk, nor does it possess any breath of life. He then essayed to show them how God breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam. But when he began to blow his breath into the image he had formed, Satan entered it, and the figure walked, and the people of his time, who had been inquiring these matters of Enosh, went astray after it, saying, What is the difference between bowing down before this image and paying homage to a man? The generation of Enosh were thus the first idol worshippers, and the punishment for their folly was not delayed long. God caused the sea to transgress its bounds, and a portion of the earth was flooded. This was the time also when the mountains became rocks, and the dead bodies of men began to decay. And still another consequence of the sin of idolatry was that the countenances of the men of the following generations were no longer in the likeness and image of God as the countenances of Adam, Seth, and Enosh had been. They resembled centaurs and apes, and the demons lost their fear of men. But there was a still more serious consequence from the idolatrous practices introduced in the time of Enosh. When God drove Adam forth from paradise, the Shekinah remained behind, enthroned above a cherub under the tree of life. The angels descended from heaven and repaired thither in hosts to receive their instructions, 
and Adam and his descendants sat by the gate to bask in the splendor of the Shekinah, sixty-five thousand times more radiant than the splendor of the sun. This brightness of the Shekinah makes all upon whom it falls exempt from disease, and neither insects nor demons can come nigh unto them to do them harm. Thus it was until the time of Enosh, when men began to gather gold, silver, gems, and pearls from all parts of the earth, and made idols thereof a thousand parasangs high. What was worse, by means of the magic arts taught them by the angels Uzza and Azael, they set themselves as masters over the heavenly spheres, and forced the sun, the moon, and the stars to be subservient to themselves instead of the Lord. This impelled the angels to ask God, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Why didst thou abandon the highest of the heavens, the seat of thy glory and thy exalted throne in Arabat, and descend to men who pay worship to idols, putting thee upon a level with them? The Shekinah was induced to leave the earth and ascend to heaven, amid the blare and flourish of the trumpets of the myriads of angel hosts. End of chapter 3, part 2three the death of eve part three of the legends of the jews volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the legends of the jews Volume 1 by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg The Fall of the Angels The depravity of mankind, which began to show itself in the time of Enosh, had increased monstrously in the time of his grandson Jared, by reason of the fallen angels. When the angels saw the beautiful, attractive daughters of men, they lusted after them, and spoke, quote, We will choose wives for ourselves only from among the daughters of men, and beget children with them. End quote. Their chief, Shemhazi, said, quote, I fear me. Ye will not put this plan of yours into execution, and I alone shall have to suffer the consequences of a great sin. End quote. Then they answered him and said, quote, We will all swear an oath, and we will bind ourselves separately and together not to abandon the plan, but to carry it through to the end. End quote. Two hundred angels descended to the summit of Mount Hermon, which owes its name to the very occurrence, because they bound themselves there to fulfill their purpose. On the penalty of Harem, anathema, under the leadership of twenty captains, they defiled themselves with the daughters of men unto whom they taught charms, conjuring formulas, how to cut roots, and the efficacy of plants. The issue from these mixed marriages was a race of giants, three thousand ells tall, who consumed the possessions of men. When all had vanished and they could obtain nothing more from them, the giants turned against them and devoured many of them, and the remnant of men began to trespass against the birds, beasts, reptiles, and fishes, eating their flesh and drinking their blood. Then the earth complained about the impious evildoers, but the fallen angels continued to corrupt mankind. Azazel taught men how to make slaughtering knives, arms, 
shields, and coats of mail. He showed them metals and how to work them, and armlets and all sorts of trinkets, and the use of rouge for the eyes, and how to beautify the eyelids, and how to ornament themselves with the rarest and most precious jewels, and all sorts of paints. The chief of the fallen angels, Shemhazai, instructed them in exorcisms and how to cut roots. Armoros taught them how to raise spells. Barakel, divination from the stars. Cockabel, astrology. Ezekiel, augury from the clouds. Erechiel, the signs of the earth. Samsawiel, the signs of the sun, Sarael, the signs of the moon. While all these abominations defiled the earth, the pious Enoch lived in a secret place. None among men knew his abode, or what had become of him, for he was sojourning with the angel watchers and holy ones. Once he heard the call addressed to him, Quote, Enoch, thou scribe of justice, go unto the watchers of the heavens, who have left the high heavens, the eternal place of holiness, defiling themselves with women, doing as men do, taking wives unto themselves, and casting themselves into the arms of destruction upon the earth. Go and proclaim unto them that they shall find neither peace nor pardon. For every time they take joy in their offspring, they shall see the violent death of their sons and sigh over the ruin of their children. They will pray and supplicate evermore, but never shall they attain to mercy or peace. End quote. Enoch repaired to Azazel and the other fallen angels to announce the doom uttered against them. They all were filled with fear. Trembling seized upon them, and they implored Enoch to set up a petition for them and read it to the Lord of heaven, for they could not speak with God as aforetime nor even raise their eyes heavenward, for shame on account of their sins. Enoch granted their request, and in a vision he was vouchsafed the answer, which he was to carry back to the angels. It appeared to Enoch that he was wafted into heaven upon clouds, and was set down before the throne of God. God spake, Quote, Go forth and say to the watchers of heaven who have sent thee hither to intercede for them, Verily, it is you who ought to plead in behalf of men, not men in behalf of you. I, why did ye forsake the high, holy and eternal heavens to pollute yourselves? with the daughters of men, taking wives unto yourselves, doing like the races of the earth, and begetting giant sons. Giants begotten by flesh and spirits will be called evil spirits on earth, and on earth will be their dwelling place. Evil spirits proceed from their bodies because they are created from above, and from the holy watchers is their beginning and primal origin. They will be evil spirits on earth, and evil spirits they will be named. And the spirits of heaven, having their dwelling in heaven, but the spirits of earth, which were born upon the earth, have their dwelling on the earth, and the spirits of the giants will devour, oppress, 
destroy, attack, do battle, and cause destruction on earth, and work affliction. They will take no kind of food, nor will they thirst, and they will be invisible. And these spirits will rise up against the children of men and against the women, because they have proceeded from them. Since the days of murder and destruction and the death of the giants, when the spirits went forth from the soul of their flesh, in order to destroy without incurring judgment. These will they destroy until the day when the great consumption of the great world be consummated. And now, as to the watchers who have sent thee to intercede for them, who had been aforetime in heaven, say to them, You have been in heaven, and though the hidden things had not yet been revealed to you, you know worthless mysteries. And in the hardness of your hearts you have recounted these to women. And through these mysteries women and men work much evil on earth. Say to them, therefore, you have no peace. End quote. Enoch ruler and teacher. After Enoch had lived a long time, secluded from men, he once heard the voice of an angel calling to him, quote, Enoch, Enoch, make thyself ready, and leave the house, and the secret place wherein thou hast kept thyself hidden, and assume dominion over men, to teach them the ways in which they shall walk and the deeds which they shall do, in order that they may walk in the ways of God. End quote. Enoch left his retreat and betook himself to the haunts of men. He gathered them about him and instructed them in the conduct pleasing to God. He sent messengers all over to announce, quote, Ye who desire to know the ways of God and righteous conduct, come ye to Enoch. End quote. Thereupon a vast concourse of people thronged about him to hear the wisdom he would teach and learn from his mouth what is good and right. Even kings and princes, no less than one hundred and thirty in number, assembled about him, and submitted themselves to his dominion, to be taught and guided by him, as he taught and guided all the others. Peace reigned thus over the whole world, all the two hundred and forty-three years during which the influence of Enoch prevailed. At the expiration of this period, in the year in which Adam died, and was buried with great honors by Seth, Enosh, Enoch, and Methuselah, Enoch resolved to retire again, from intercourse with men, and devote himself wholly to the service of God. But he withdrew gradually. First he would spend three days in prayer and praise of God, and on the fourth day he would return to his disciples and grant them instruction. Many years passed thus, then he appeared among them but once a week, later once a month, and finally once a year. The kings, princes, and all others who were desirous of seeing Enoch and hearkening to his words did not venture to come close to him during the times of his retirement. Such awful majesty sat upon his countenance, they feared for their very life if they but looked at him. 
They therefore resolved that all men should proffer their requests before Enoch on the day he showed himself unto them. The impression made by the teachings of Enoch upon all who heard them was powerful. They prostrated themselves before him and cried, quote, Long live the king! Long live the king! End quote. On a certain day, while Enoch was giving audience to his followers, an angel appeared and made known unto him that God had resolved to install him as king over the angels in heaven, as until then he had reigned over men. He called together all the inhabitants of the earth and addressed them thus, quote, I have been summoned to ascend into heaven, and I know not on what day I shall go thither. Therefore I will teach you wisdom and righteousness before I go hence. End quote. A few days yet Enoch spent among men, and all the time left to him he gave instruction in wisdom, knowledge, God-fearing conduct, and piety, and established law and order for the regulation of the affairs of men. Then those gathered near him saw a gigantic steed descend from the skies, and they told Enoch of it, who said, quote, the steed is for me, for the time has come and the day when I leave you, never to be seen again. End quote. So it was, the steed approached Enoch, and he mounted upon its back, all the time instructing the people, exhorting them, enjoining them to serve God and walk in his ways. Eight hundred thousand of the people followed a day's journey after him, but on the second day Enoch urged his retinue to turn back. Quote, Go ye home, lest death overtake you, if you follow me farther. End quote. Most of them heeded his words and went back, but a number remained with him for six days though he admonished them daily to return and not bring death down upon themselves. On the sixth day of the journey, he said to those still accompanying him, quote, Go home ye, for on the morrow I shall ascend to heaven, and whoever will then be near me, he will die. End quote. Nevertheless, some of his companions remained with him, saying, quote, Whithersoever thou goest, we will go. By the living God, death alone shall part us. End quote. On the seventh day, Enoch was carried into the heavens in a fiery chariot drawn by fiery chargers. The day thereafter, the kings who had turned back in good time sent messengers to inquire into the fate of the men who had refused to separate themselves from Enoch, for they had noted the number of them. They found snow and great hailstones upon the spot whence Enoch had risen, and when they searched beneath, they discovered the bodies of all who had remained behind with Enoch. He alone was not among them. He was on high in heaven. End of chapter 3, part 3 Recording by Robert Scott August the 9th, 2007